Right then, uh, good morning everybody. Is everybody uh, seated comfortably? Okay, well, uh, first of all, thanks for, for coming and joining uh, Northern Gas Networks today. Um, I'm just going to run through a few, a few standard safety things before passing over to our CEO, Mark Horsley, who's going to open the conference. So just a few uh, standard things. Um, there's no fire alarm test today. The emergency exits are here. Uh, there's one at the back and then down the stairs at the front. The, uh, the fire alarm is actually a voice alarm. So um, please remain seated until it, it tells you to do something different. And then the assembly point is the car park at the front. Um, most of you will know that Fair is actually a secure site, so please don't kind of go wandering around the site. Uh, we have to stay within the area that, that we're allocated, which is kind of the canteen and outside and, and this area. Um, if I could ask if anyone's got any mobile phones, if you could ensure that they're, they're turned off or on silent. The toilets, um, there's some downstairs, but also if you come out back into the foyer and, and then kind of take a right, there's some toilets back down on the far side at the left. Um, smoking, for those of you who smoke, you need to go downstairs. It's not out on the front doors. There's a, there's a uh, corridor on the right. Go down the corridor and there's a cabin at the far end of that corridor where you can smoke. Um, and finally, um, all the presentations that you're going to see today uh, are on the memory sticks that are, should be in your welcome packs. So you don't need to take notes, obviously, unless you want to. And the other thing that we're doing is we're videoing the conference today. So what we're hoping to be able to do is send you all a link so you can actually go onto the web and play the entire thing back so you can obviously put the presentations with the actual um, uh, speakers who are talking to them. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass over to our CEO, Mark Horsley, to, uh, to introduce the conference. Thank you, Dan. I noticed how we had to look at my name there before he said it. <laughs> Not too impressed with that, Dan. <laughs> I also wondered when I first came into the room who was going to be the first for the DNA. Does it remind you of a, a TV set, Mr. Kyle? <laughs> um, I'm really genuinely excited and, uh, oh, use those, genuinely excited about today. Um, since I've been in the organisation, um, which is only three years, we've talked a lot about the technical aspects of. Um, biomethane and how we can get it onto our grid. What we were really keen in, in NGN was to, and working with iGEM on this particular conference, was bringing all the pieces of the supply chain together. So as a network, we know where our network is and we know where we can connect it to and the good points of connecting uh, on the network. Within what you'll see today is joining all those dots together with people from project management, the commercial contracts that's needed to put that together, banks for funding it, and then a the technology to actually make it work. And I think this is probably the first that's happened in the UK where we've brought all those people together, and particularly, particularly from a local area uh, that covers our area. We have uh, 2.7 million customers in our area. We cover from uh, Yorkshire, mainly East Yorkshire and West Yorkshire, right the way up the coastline up to uh, Berwick-on-Tweed, and then across into Cumbria. Uh, Workington, Carlisle area. So we've got a massive coverage and hopefully there's a number of people here from that area. So I don't intend talking about uh, low carbon economies, I don't talk, uh, talk about what we're going to be doing in terms of renewables. What I'm really interested in today is making something happen. And hopefully what you'll see today from both the audience participation, the questions and the brilliant, brilliant stalls that's out there for people to get together and to join those dots uh, throughout the day and make this happen. And as NGN, we are 100%, probably 150% behind this. And we have a, a saying within our group, uh, the Chunkong group, about relentlessly doing things. So we don't give up on things. So these aren't initiatives. We don't run initiatives in our business and we don't run initiatives outside. What we do run are programs, things that have an enduring uh, life to them. So I hope you really enjoy today. I'd like to take this opportunity, because I may not be able to stand around, uh, stay around, uh, to thank Dan and the team. He's had numbers of sleepless nights running up to this, making sure everything would go together. And I'd really like to thank Dan and his team for all the effort they put in today, in advance of what I know will be a great conference. So thanks, Dan. Mark. Well, thanks for that, Mark. Um, 
Like Matt said, I'm, I'm Dan Sadler, and, and I'm kind of the guy who's, who's been trying to pull this together, um, heavily supported, I might add, by the presenters who are going to be speaking today and, and various other people. And obviously we've, we've run the conference in, in conjunction with iGEM, who have helped doing the marketing and coordination, so a, a big thanks to those guys as well. Uh, my role in, in NGN is I'm Head of Investment Planning and Major Projects, so all our major project bills come under my remit. And just to start the conference off, I thought it's probably worth just running through the agenda for the day. So the aim of today, and, and it is, like Mark said, it's a different angle on this biomethane agenda. And, and what we've done in NGN is we've spent a lot of time finding these people. And I'm going to come on to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So we, we've spent 12 months or so doing a study to understand in our network, in our area, which again I'm going to sort you through, actually who could be a viable producer of biomethane. And there's some people who are probably very well versed in the subject and there's other people who we believe probably don't actually even know that there's this opportunity available to them. So we've got to this conference, gas to cash, um, and we're at this stage where we hope that we've found a lot of the most credible and likely producers to start to take up, uh, advantage of this opportunity. So the way we've split this morning, and it is a morning session, is we're going to do a session up to the first break, which is around developing a business plan. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the background, really, and set the day up. So I'm going to talk to you about, firstly, who Northern Gas Networks are, for those of you who may not be quite clear, um, what biomethane is, um, why we are interested in it, and then I'm going to talk you through the, the feasibility study, and I'm going to talk you through the, the connections issue. Then I'm going to pass over to Rob Heap of Rob Heap Consulting, and John Murphy of Future Biogas, and we're going to give you some commercial examples, um, and they're going to talk to you about what makes a viable biomethane project. After that, we'll have a question and answer session on our Jeremy Kyle set, um, and then we'll break for tea and coffee. After tea and coffee, we're going, to work, we're going to talk about finance. So with these projects, they're not cheap projects, but they should, if they're done correctly, be highly lucrative. But one thing you need to build a project is you need finance. And to get finance, you need a robust business plan, which we'll talk through. And you also need some form of contract on who's going to buy your gas. So Peter Williams from E.ON is going to talk to you about how you secure contracts for um, buying your biomethane that you produce. And then we're going to pass over to uh, Bruce Nelson from Compass Renewables and Nick Simmons and Richard Waters from Royal Bank of Scotland who are going to talk to you about the financing options for these type of projects. Finally, I'm going to talk about the next steps, and, and like Mark uh, said, this isn't a one-stop shop for Northern Gas Networks. This is, 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 if you like, the start of a journey. We've been on it anyway, but what we want to do is carry that on, and we want to carry it on with the people in this audience who are hopefully inspired enough to start picking up and really accelerating this biomethane agenda. So firstly, a bit about ourselves. Some people may, be, may understand um, who Northern Gas Networks are, for, but for those of you who, who maybe don't, like Mark said, we, we, we actually transport gas to 2.7 million customers. So j just to differentiate that, you don't buy gas from us, we don't own the gas. What we do own is we own the network. And the shippers who you and I buy our gas from, so that could be E.ON, it could be British Gas, it could be PowerGen, are who you buy your gas from. And they pay us to transport it through our network. But it's our network that you would have to connect to buy an EFM project to. So we're a critical cog in this wheel. We maintain over 37,000 kilometres of pipelines. We've got a, a lot of infrastructure, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that a, a little bit later in the presentation. And we've around £1.7 billion pounds worth of regulated assets. So we're a, we're a pretty big company. Just to show you exactly where we're based, uh, I know I mentioned it earlier, but that's our, our patch. So we are pretty much the north of England. Uh, we cover the Lake District, all the Scottish border, right down the east coast, down to the Humber Estuary and all the, the Pennines area, to, pretty much to just north of Sheffield. So this is where we focused our study, and this is the businesses who are a part of our community who are in this room. So that's a little bit about ourselves, and, and um, apologies to those in the room who may be well versed in biomethane, but for those of you who may be looking at this for the first time, uh, it's probably worth a, a little bit of time just to understand what actually is biomethane, and I don't mean the technicalities of it, just in principle. 
So first of all, and this is where we are today, we've, you need producers. And producers are people who have waste or rubbish or what you could call spare resource that's actually appropriate to put into a process to, to produce a byproduct from it, which is biogas. So the producers can come from lots of different industrial sectors or organisations. There's the agricultural sector, um, there's the industrial and commercial food waste sectors, the wastewater sector, um, and then there's the councils and the waste distributors. So they're the key areas who could really take the advantage of this opportunity because they naturally have this resource or waste available to them and it's just trying to change maybe what they're currently doing with it. So from there, if you think, well, actually, this sounds great and I want to be a biomethane producer, well, the first thing you have to do, providing you've got the funding in place, which is what we're going to talk you through today, is you need to build a digester. And a digester, very simple terms, is a great big vat. A little bit more technical than that, but for, for simplicity, it's a big vat where you put your, your resource. And within that vat, um, there's a process called anaerobic digestion occurs, uh, where microorganisms break down that resource in the absence of oxygen. And when they do that, they produce a byproduct, and that byproduct is biogas. And biogas is, like I said, the, the byproduct of the breakdown of that waste or resource. Now, at the moment, and, and due to lots of reasons, but at the moment, what, there are companies who actually do this process. This isn't new, it's not, you know, no, it's not a new concept. There are pr plenty of companies who do this, but most of them at the moment choose to convert that biogas to electricity and they do that by putting it in a combined heat and power unit like this, effectively fueling that unit to drive a turbine to create electricity and then they sell that electricity to grid. And maybe a few years ago that, that was possibly the best option for it but we believe it certainly isn't the best option today. And what we'd like to happen is from the biogas what you can now do is you can convert your biogas to biomethane. And biomethane, very simplistically, is, is cleaned up biogas. And it makes it have properties that closely resemble the natural gas that we put through our system. So you can't just put biogas into our system because it doesn't have the right properties. You can put biomethane into our system. And there's our network. So Northern Gas Networks owns all the infrastructure within our patch. So we own the gas holders, low pressure network, medium pressure, high pressure network. So that's a little bit about biomethane. So you might be thinking, well, why are NGN doing this? What's in it for NGN? I think most people are aware of the UK's carbon agenda um, and, and the UK government's uh, targets for carbon reductions and also for the introduction of renewable energies. Um, well, NGN are, are certainly aware of that. We're a big organisation, we're a responsible organisation, so we support that agenda. But we're also encouraged in that space through our regulator, and our regulator is Ofgem. So, for those of you who don't know what a regulated business, Ofgem um, is our regulator, and Ofgem at the moment are encouraging um, us, as all the other networks, to push the boundaries of innovation. And the way they're doing that is in what's called Rio. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but Rio is our business plan. And it's actually the price control period that's set from 2013, so we've just started it, to 2021. And the acronym Rio stands for Re Re Revenue times Incentives times Innovation, sorry, plus um, equals Outputs. And the key fact here is this, Outputs. And what Ofgem do is they measure our business plan against delivering those outputs. And some of those output, outputs around this agenda, there's one of them, which is the total capacity of biomethane connected to our network, so that's a measure. And the next output is the number of active biomethane <coughs> applications that are in progress. So there are two outputs of our business plan, so with a vested interest to try and encourage and facilitate, which is what we're trying to do, this biomethane agenda. So we've got to here, which is the uh, gas to cash conference. And what the question really is, is where do we want to go now? So the current number of biomethane producers connected to the Northern Gas Network's grid is zero. So no one yet has actually connected. Um, we're pretty confident that uh, our uh, colleagues up in Northumbria Water are going to have the first connection next year, which is uh, the Howden Sewage Works. 
but there's currently only maybe one or maybe two that might be connecting in, in the short term. And it's worth saying that this agenda, incidentally, for a lot of these producers could have short, medium and long term. So some people will be able to take advantage of this quickly, other people will be medium term, and other people may need to set some fundamental changes in the way they organise the waste distribution around their business to take advantage. What do we believe following the study could be the potential producers operating within our area, the area that I showed you earlier, and it could be hundreds. So we've done the study, Rob Heap did the study for us, and we believe there could be hundreds of potential producers. And it's trying to get those producers engaged in this, in this agenda, and also trying to work with the producers to understand how you get your business plan in place, your funding in place, to have a credible project. Now what we could be doing today is we could be talking through lots and lots of technical information which as an engineer I really enjoy doing but I'm sure a lot of people in the audience would, would get either lost in it or incredibly bored by it. So the point is we don't need to do that and the reason we don't need to do that is that one of the big um, obstacles to, to really accelerating this biomethane issue was around the technicalities of it. But through a lot of work within this industry over the last few years, most of those technical challenges have actually been addressed. So we don't need to talk and dwell on the technical, technical issues. So what we're trying to do as a network is we're trying to put the biomethane agenda in the space of a business decision. The technology does work. It is proven. It is agreed. And actually, what we should be doing is looking at this as a credible business case to say, actually, as a business, can I make a lot of potential revenue from this opportunity. And what will that do? Well, <coughs> firstly, if we can encourage this, the, the take up a by me thing connection to our network, it helps improve our network because most people will know there's a, a depleting supply of gas in the North Sea. We're increasingly dependent upon gas coming in from Europe. Well, actually, having a lot of biomethane connections within the network itself will help maintain secure, security of supply and sustainability. But the big thing as well for Northern Gas Networks is it's great for creating opportunities for our local businesses, our customers, and everybody in that patch generally is, is touched in some way by us. So not only is there opportunities for the businesses who take advantage of the biomethane agenda, but all the infrastructure that goes around building them projects, it can create a great opportunity for our network. And the irony is that that's taken an opportunity actually from what you might call your waste or you might call your rubbish, but what we prefer to call it is your spare resource. In most instances, this is stuff that's out there. It's just the application of what we do with it. Are we just exporting it to landfill? What are we actually doing with it? And if we can change that mindset, then there's a lot of opportunities for a lot of different areas and different individuals and organisations. Like I said, it's a huge financial opportunity. And when Rob comes and does his pres presentation in a minute, and then John does his uh, after that, we're going to talk you through some um, real commercial examples of the type of investment you need, the type of payback, and the type of return that you can expect long term. And a lot of people don't even know that that opportunity is there. So again, coming back to this conference, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to really help facilitate people picking up this ball and, and, and trying to take advantage of this opportunity. So here's the research. So I did mention that we've, we've spent 12 months doing a study. That's how we've got to this space. That's how we've got a lot of the individuals in this room here. And what we did is we actually commissioned uh, Rob Heap to go out and actively find all the potential producers who have what we call critical mass. And Rob's going to talk through critical mass in his presentation. But basically that means simplistically the correct volume of resource or waste or however you want to term it to have a viable project so the commercials work in terms of the investment to do the project and the return based on the resource and the sectors that we studied is we studied the commercial and industrial food waste sectors and I'm going to give you examples of all this in a little while but the commercial and industrial food waste sectors as you expect were centred around the big urban areas so Carlisle, Newcastle, Gateshead, Sunderland, Middlesbrough all the West Yorkshire region and over in Hull. So, great opportunities, but we maybe need to think about how we pull those opportunities together. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Then we looked at the councils, and a lot of councils are here today. Um, now, we believe that there's only Leeds and Calderdale Council 
who are actually in the space where they request food to be segregated at source. So in, in our homes, you'd have to separate your food at source, separate receptacle, and it's collected separately because you can't contaminate it because the, the digester won't like it. East Riding and uh, Kingston-upon-Hull, they're actually kind of part of the way there, but what they do is mix, mix garden waste, and although you can maybe put that in a digester, it's not as efficient. We're not quite sure where everybody else is on their strategies, but um, certainly the councils are in a, a unique position to, to try to kind of um, take advantage of this opportunity. But it might be a more long-term goal for some councils who may have specific strategies in place already. Existing facilities. So I did mention that there are a lot of existing facilities, more than we, we probably first thought there the, the were in the network, but none of these are connected to our grid. And there's, there's 21 within our network, and we believe from a desk-based assessment that there could be 10 that should seriously be considering converting the biogas to biomethane as opposed to converting it to electricity because it's far more lucrative. We then looked at the farming community. And interestingly enough, in the farming community, it's a great opportunity. But what we believe is there's probably not one farmer who, in his own right, has enough resource and enough security of resource, more importantly, to take advantage of the opportunity. Um, you can see there's a lot of dairy over in Cumbria. Uh, there's a lot of pig uh, farming over on the east coast, poultry down the central belt. And then the other thing to know is there's a lot of glass houses around the Humber estuary. And the beauty of glass houses is a byproduct of converting biogas to biomethane is carbon dioxide, and the glass houses will buy the carbon dioxide off you. So in terms of your business plan, you may need slightly less resource because you've actually got another revenue three stream through your sale of your carbon dioxide. And then we looked at the water um, sector. So these are all the sewage works. Um, interestingly, human waste, you need a huge amount of it to have a viable project. Um, so it's only the biggest sewage works that are viable. Uh, there's Howden and Brand Sands up at Northumbria Water. Howden, hopefully, is uh, going to connect next year. Um, and then we've got East Hull and Eshalt in the Yorkshire Water area, which we also believe are credible for the, uh, the critical mass criteria. It's also worth noting, and Rob will touch on this in his presentation, that there's things that the water companies can do working in conjunction with the waste industries where they can actually take advantage of their existing asset infrastructure to, to actually increase the amount of resource and make it more efficient. Rob will touch on that briefly in, in his presentation. So that was a study. And from there, what we've tried to do is gather all the experts. It's worth mentioning that the presentations this morning are around developing your business plan. If you want to look at this and take advantage of this opportunity, it's how do I develop a business plan? What actually is my opportunity? And then once I think there is an opportunity, how do I talk to the network? How do I talk to the suppliers to obtain a contract? And ultimately, how do I get finance to build this project? But what you will know is missing from there is the technology experts. And the way we've done the technology experts is that all the technology experts are in the exhibition. So please take the time to go and talk to them and really understand the technology better. Um, and, and that's why these guys are here, because clearly when you get to the funding state, it's them guys who are going to be building your project or you're going to be buying their products. Like I said, all these experts are here to try and help you how to turn this opportunity into a reality. Now at this point, what I could do is uh, I could have passed over to uh, Rob and John to talk you through the, the kind of business case bit, but just for consistency and, and, and continuity, we, we've not done that. But what you will generally do, or what I would think people would do, is if you think, actually, is this credible for, for my company or organisation, the first thing I'd suggest you do is talk to the project management companies, and again, there's some talking here today, some in the exhibition. Um, and really understand how, how viable is that for yourself, or do you need to partner up, or actually is it just not a viable proposition for your specific um, organisation. But once you've understood that and you think this is credible for us, one of the things you have to do is you have to contact Northern Gas Networks, and we do have a stand in the exhibition. Um, it's going to be a man stand, obviously, after lunch. Please come and talk to us to, to just talk through this if you need any more information. And just before I get into examples for each sector about how you obtain a connection once you think, well, actually, I've got a viable project, it's worth just mentioning that 
<coughs> within the gas networks, we have low, medium, intermediate, and high pressure mains. And if you think of them mains, they're full of gas. And just like a sink, if a sink were full of water, you can't put any more water in until you pull the plug, because it's full. And our gas mains have the same problem, where actually, if our mains are full, then we have to wait until demand picks up before someone can inject. And one of the challenges around biomethane is you need a constant injection rate for the most successful project. So what we as a network have to do is we have to look and see if the mains that, that are near you can actually take the <coughs> capacity of injection that you need. So that's one of the, the other f the key elements within your business plan. So just to give you some examples of that. So this is the commercial and industrial food waste sector that I showed you earlier. Um, huge extensive list, we've just put a, an element of them there. And uh, Cranswick Country Foods, who I, I believe are in the audience today, um, we believe that you guys are probably the only, from a desk-based assessment, um, company in that arena who may actually have enough critical mass in your own right to have a viable project. So let's say that is the case and you talk the to the project managers and our desk-based assessment is correct. That's where you guys are located. So that's Cranswick Country Foods. And one of the things that you can see from that is that one of the things around Cranswick Country Food is land. And to build one of these projects, you obviously need land. The digesters are big things. The kit that you're going to put on there is quite a big kit. So you need land. Now, whether or not that's your land, obviously I don't know, but that factor into your business case. But the point is, there is land available around you. The other thing that you can see is that a lot of that land looks like it could be arable land. And if you don't quite have critical mass in your own right, it might be that you can work with the farmers around you to actually firstly secure the resource, so the waste to put in there, but also to actually make your project more credible from a financial business case point of view. Now what you do is if you get to that stage and you think, oh, this is great for us, we want to build a biomethane project, then you talk to the network. And we have these maps for everywhere within our paths, so within that network area. And these maps show you the different mains, so all the red and uh, low pressure, you've got medium pressure, and then the green one here is an intermediate pressure main. Now intermediate pressure mains are often, not always, the best ones that you can connect into because they can probably take the flow rates that you want to put into them. That's not necessarily always the case, and it might be that a low pressure main has the capacity or a medium pressure main. Excuse me, but um, one of the things you can see here is that we do actually have a main that's very close to the Cranswick site. And one of the benefits of that is that in terms of your overall project costs of building your project, once you've built your site, you then need to build a pipeline to connect to our main. Well, the first thing you can see here is, one, you're not a long way away from one, so that's not going to be as expensive as it may be for other projects. But the other great advantage here is there's no physical obstructions there's no rivers, there's no roads, there's no rail. So actually the connection in itself should be cheaper, not cheap, but cheaper, than one where you're a long way away and you might have a railway and a motorway to cross. So that's the example for Cranswick. So moving on to the councils. Um, uh, and like I said earlier, the councils, we believe uh, there's only Leeds and Calderdale who are in the space of segregating food waste at source, which is what you really need to be doing. Uh, we don't obviously know what the council's strategies are for how they're going uh, to evolve their food collection in the future, but certainly Leeds and Calderdale could potentially take advantage of this opportunity relatively quickly. Now one of the beauties with the councils is there's Leeds, and one of the things you can see, huge urban sprawl, lots of pockets of land. And when you layer that over to our mains network, Lots and lots and lots of mains at every single tier possible. Now the councils have the advantage that they probably own lots of land around Leeds and they're also in charge of planning permission, which is maybe an additional uh, factor in their business case. But um, what we can do with the councils is we can work with the councils to identify where is the absolute opportune location for you to build your digesters or your equipment so that the main can accept the flows you want to put in it but also it's maybe near a piece of land that you actually own. So we'd like to work with you to try and understand that if this is an agenda that you'd like to pick up, well, where's the best location to site your digester? 
Obviously, you guys have got to look then, which Rob will come on to, about how you collect that waste. You have waste distributors with different contracts. You need different vehicles. So again, in the terms of the business plan, it's a, it's a different spec business plan. And it's worth noting that each and every application will have its own little nuances that you need to understand. Another thing I thought it'd just be worth to put up, we've, we found this on a news feed, well, Rob found it. Um, and it's that in Manchester, over 300 restaurants and hotels have actually signed up to a, a, a local food waste scheme. And the aim of that scheme is to make the Manchester hospitality sector, and if you think of the waste from that sector, it's astronomical, um, the greenest in the UK. And what they're doing with that is they're putting it into an AD plant. Whether they're going to connect it to grid or, or uh, create electricity, obviously, I don't know. It's outside our patch, this one. But I think, and I think Northern Gas Network think, well, why can't we be the greenest network in the UK? And all our cities be taking advantage of this opportunity. But who drives that agenda, in, in my mind, could either be the councils or it can be the waste distributors. But that's happening in Manchester now. So on to the farming community. Uh, again, there's an example. I mean, as, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots of farms. We don't believe any farm within its own right has enough critical mass to have a viable project. But the farming community has got lots of advantages. So just to give you one example of what's happening at the moment, there, there is a project at the moment that's um, kind of in the business plan phase. Um, and there's a big nursery, so it's over towards Hull. And what that nursery is doing, who are going to buy the CO2, is they're working with the farmers around it to produce a viable biomethane project. And they've come to us for a connection. I'm not quite sure where we are on the analysis of that, but certainly there's a mains infrastructure around them. But they're probably rarer opportunities. What we think could be an opportunity, and again, it's maybe for the farming community to work together, and then we're happy to facilitate, facilitate localised workshops. As you can see here, this is an example in, Humber, uh, in Cumbria. So there's a dairy farm there, there's a dairy farm there, there's a poultry farm there, and there's lots of arable farms around it. And what we think would be a great opportunity is for that farming community to work together, and it gives them lots of advantages. Firstly, in terms of your business plan, a critical factor in your business plan is how secure your resources. So obviously you need to produce a constant flow of gas. Well, if there's more than one of you with lots of different pockets of resource that can feed in, you have more security within your actual fuel, if you like. Um, the other benefit to that is the land. So obviously between all those farmers, you own lots and lots of land. And when you layer that over to our ma network mains maps, that's just a high pressure network. Vast, vast intermingled network. That's not even got the intermediate pressure or the medium pressure or the low pressure on it. So what you can do is you might be over in this location and we can work with you to say, well, actually, where's the opportune point for you to build your digester that reduces your costs and allows you to inject into an appropriate main? So again, um, that's, uh, that's the way we see that, that sector evolving. Um, I won't spend too much time on the wastewater sector. Um, Rob, Rob's going to cover it, but we've, uh, we've got uh, Howden and Brand Sands and then with have uh, Eshol and East Hull, which we believe are the, the most viable projects. Um, there are things you can do, like I said, with your existing asset infrastructure, working with the waste community to actually make your plant more efficient and increase your critical mass. And then finally, on to the existing um, uh, AD plants that currently we believe are, are using the gas to export to um, grid electricity wise um, so again we've got the list of the 21 I know a lot of you guys are here today and thanks for coming but um, what we would say there is if you've contacted, contacted us before or if um, you've never contacted us please talk to us because obviously you've got the infrastructure built you're just trying to convert the biogas back to the biomethane or rather to biomethane um, and see if you've got a convenient injection point. And when you see the business case examples that the guys after this are going to present you with, uh, you know, I, I think that could be a worthwhile investment for certainly a lot of that sector. So that's just about it from me. So uh, I'd just like to say again, thank you very much for joining us today. I think it's great how many people have turned up. Um, and just a few things to leave you with is... Please, if you're interested in, in uh, this opportunity, please come and sport, talk to NGN. You know, we're in the exhibition. We'll be about most of the afternoon, so please come and talk to us if you want more information. Please go and talk to the technology providers who are out there to understand the technology a little bit better. Um, 
And what we would say and what we'd like to, to kind of put out there now is that this isn't the end of this journey for us and it's over to you. What we want to do is for, if there's enough people who are interested, we want to start running facilitated workshops. And that might be facilitated workshops around the gas network connection, it might be around the business case development, it might be around obtaining commercial contracts for the sale of your gas, it might be around the finance. And what we want to do is bring different parts of those communities together with the people who are trying to generate the project to help you work through the business case and get your project off the ground. Um, and all the other networks are here today as well. Uh, again, thanks very much for coming. And um, obviously, we, you guys, were more than happy if you'd like to come in and have a have a kind of workshop with us, and we'll walk you through the study that, that Rob did. If you're interested in doing it in your own networks, so that's it from me. Um, hopefully, you found that informative. Uh, like I said, the question and answers is going to be after Rob's, then John's. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Rob Heap now, who's going to talk you through uh, critical mass. Thank you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you, Dan, for that um, very, very interesting presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rob Heap of Rob Heap Consulting, and this is the biomethane report that we were commissioned to provide for Northern Gas Networks. I must acknowledge the very, very detailed input of some people who helped us to produce that report, and that is Dave Orty of Entech AMEC, who looked at the water sector. Roger Hallowell of Tefki, who helped with some of the agricultural work. And Eunomia, who looked at some of the food arisings from the local authorities and commercial industrial sector. They complemented the work that we did ourselves and enhanced the depth and breadth of the report. Thank you very much. What I'd like to do is, as best I can, take Dan's brief and talk you through very quickly thinking outside of the box to achieve project critical mass for biomethane to grid. First, a little bit about me. I'm an engineer, mechanical engineer. I first got involved in anaerobic digestion on a project that's literally no more than five miles away from here on a pig farm, a very large pig farm, and we produced 60 kilowatts of electricity in 1984, 5, 6, and 7 from very, very basic technology. That is where I cut my teeth on AD. That project was only made viable by virtue of a financial incentive. That incentive was given by Northern Electric, the electrical distribution company, as a private incentive. And it was the only reason why that project, outside of wastewater and outside of some commercial industrial treatment plants, that AD was able to succeed. Today, the same situation applies. Without commercial incentives, financial incentives, in the mainstream arena, AD is very difficult to justify. So I need to have a look at um, the ways in which we can make AD work financially and make profit for the developers and owners of plants. I'd like to just look at the, very quickly, AD in the energy cycle. Why biomethane to grid? Because, after all, that's what we're here to talk about. 
What is critical mass? The revenue potential by sector. Are smaller plants feasible? What feedstock do you need? In agriculture, food recycling, the water industry. Are there opportunities for cross-sector collaboration? A little bit about business case development and then move on to later on today the opportunities to realize your goal. AD and the energy cycle. AD is a process which is enhanced under controlled circumstances to develop biogas. And biogas can be turned into biomethane for injection into Northern Gas Network's grid. And an AD plant typically consists of <coughs> tanks, one, two, three, four, or more tanks, and a biomethane upgrading system. AD is a very flexible process. It suits a wide range of industries and applications. For me to even scratch the surface in the 20 minutes or so that Dan has allocated to talk to you today is going to be very, very challenging. I'm going to talk very generically. I cannot talk specifically on case-specific issues. It's impossible to do so in 20 minutes. Happy to do so later, and also I'm sure all the other stakeholders in the industry will be happy to do that with you as well. So what does AD do in terms of the energy cycle? Very simply, it takes organic resources, putrescible resources, preferably not containing lignin, like woody materials, leaves, certainly not soil and grit, and under controlled conditions in the digester creates biogas which then can be converted to biomethane or if following today's presentations you feel as though you cannot actually achieve critical mass project size and I'll go on to what that is later you may justify having a smaller AD plant and producing electricity. Biomethane, based on today's capital expenditure, does need projects to be larger than very small scale CHP. So once we've produced the biomethane, we've achieved critical mass, we then inject into the grid and the consumer, whether it be a domestic or an industrial consumer, can use that gas for heat and power in the conventional way. A byproduct of anaerobic digestion is digestate, organic fertilizer, and typically, very quickly, around 85% of what you put into an AD plant comes out by volume as digestate, organic fertilizer. That typically goes back onto agricultural lands or can be treated but it's quite expensive to treat it, to put it into the sewer, to produce food and resources to complete the cycle. Why biomethane to grid? Why is everybody here today? Anybody want to tell me why you're here today? Make money, exactly. And that is what biomethane can offer. I want to compare very basically the energy efficiency and tariffs that are available between more conventional CHP based biogas or AD plants and biomethane. CHP converts biogas into electrical efficiency at a maximum of 43%. Biomethane converts it at much higher, a minimum of 95%. What I'm going to compare is the tariff for an over 500 kilowatt electrical AD plant 
which attracts a feed-in tariff from um, administered by Ofgem but is currently subject to digression. Today, if you can accredit for feed-in tariff, you will get 9.24 pence per kilowatt hour. In 2014, you're possibly going to get about 8.3, 8.4 because it's subject to 10% digression. Biogas to grid or biomethane is not subject to digression and currently <coughs> you can enjoy 7.3 pence per kilowatt hour. On top of that you get the wholesale electricity sales or the wholesale biomethane sales 5.5p per kilowatt hour, 2.5p per kilowatt hour which means your total income is getting on for 15p for a CHP based system getting on for 10p for a biomethane system. Okay, you say, well that's not very attractive, I'll do CHP. Sure. But what about the efficiency? Convert those numbers by 43% efficiency, and you get that by 95% efficiency, and that is your net revenue potential. A significant difference of approximately 47% higher. That doesn't mean to say that you're going to make 47% more profit, bottom line, because the costs of a biomethane to grid project will be higher than the equivalent size CHP project. But it's a very good starting point from which to work. If you've got an increased revenue of that sort of magnitude, it is very well worth going for a biomethane project if you possibly can achieve critical mass. I have not included in this figure, these figures here, any commercial heat sale opportunity from the CHP. That could be worth one and a half, two pence per kilowatt hour, but it is very, very difficult to realize. I've not compared the rocks in here, I've compared the feed-in tariff. Rocks are another type of tariff but they will be phased out, they will be replaced by another system but I think in terms of the funders who will be speaking later on today they prefer the feed-in tariff because it is more bankable, it is more guaranteed it is more stable and I've not considered any other business case enhancements in that slide. So going on to the real reason for this presentation, what is critical mass? Well essentially what it is, it's trying to get your project up to a size where it's justified, where it makes you that money that you want to make, the way it pays off the finance, whether it can, can cover all its costs and can actually put you some money in the bank for the term of the scheme. I have had to be really quite careful in putting up this figure because it can, this slide, because it can be a little bit misleading. As I say, I'm scratching on the surface but a typical critical mass target biomethane to grid figure would need to be a minimum of 150 cubic meters per hour. And at that level there would need to be a very, very favorable set of conditions to deliver your project. That's in agriculture. In the food recycling, household, commercial and industrial food, that figure will be higher because of the cost of compliance with the burdensome regulatory system. In the water industry, 300 cubic meters we think is about the area in which the water industry projects will start to make sense on the balance sheet. What does that actually mean in terms of revenue potential by sector? So if a farm-based project was able to achieve 150 
cubic meters of biomethane per hour injection capacity. It would be very similar to a 700 kilowatt CHP and the daily income on the tariff and the sale of the gas would be in the region of 3,500 pounds. Food recycling because of the high level of critical mass that's required to cover the costs would equate to approximately a 1.1 megawatt or 1100 kilowatt CHP with a 5,500 pound daily income. Wastewater, <coughs> co-digesting, uh, feedstock at the 300 cubic meter per hour biomethane injection level would be equivalent to about a 1.4 megawatt or 1400 kilowatt CHP and the daily income would be in the region of 7,000 pounds. All of the tariffs are underlinked, underpinned by 20 years of RHI payments and those are index linked. Generally speaking, when all the costs have been netted off, typically, like for like, a significant increase in profitability is achievable with biomethane of in the region of or greater than 30%. Are smaller plants feasible? It is possible, but you have to look very carefully at the resources and the features that are available to you. You can have the opportunity to trade the gas through the green gas trading system. As Dan alluded to, you may be able to make a case for purifying the CO2 and selling that. In the um, food sector, there are something called gate fees, which is where all food that is recycled attracts a fee for the recycler or the owner of a biogas plant or whatever other technology and every ton of food that comes onto his premises he gets a payment which is called a gate fee and I believe that according to the latest RAP figures the gate fee for anaerobic digestion is 41 pounds a ton currently across the UK so if you can attract that and I'm not suggesting everybody can because there are complications for the farming community particularly to attract that type of material in more burdensome regulatory um, obstacles but if you can attract that and overcome those regulatory constraints then it could be an interesting thing to do. One of the biggest influences on operating costs is the feedstock cost so look at that very carefully and reduce that as much as possible feedstock cost to cubic meters of gas produced. The other enhancement that may be able to allow you to reduce critical mass is look at realizing existing assets. Do you have a suitable site, etc., etc. In some cases, does the business is the business prevented from expanding? And if so, can AD help in terms of environmental benefits, in terms of carbon reduction and carbon credentials? Does it help the business, the core business, diversify? Reducing the capital expenditure, can you share costs? There are hub and pod systems, there are virtual networks. We won't go into those, I don't have time, but there are means by which you can actually improve the balance sheet by embracing these things. So what type and quantity of feedstock do you need? Very important because without feedstock you don't have a project. In the agricultural and glasshouse sectors, typically you would put in slurry and manure, slurry from the pig and the dairy industry or the cattle industry, manure the same, poultry litter, this is the bedding that the poultry are housed on, grass silage, maize silage and rye silage. These are only six potential feedstocks. There are 60, 70, 80 more. This is just a snapshot of what is possible. And a typical diet for this type of material 
It's typical, but it is not the only diet. It could be a mixture of those. It could be only one of those feedstocks. It doesn't have to be that diet. But that is the sort of quantity of material that you would need to achieve critical mass of 150 or more cubic meters of biomethane injection capacity. It is quite considerable, and that's why, as Dan alluded to, look around, see if you can work with neighbors to bring that sort of feedstock to your project. In the household, commercial, and industrial sectors, the food recycling sector, I'm very pleased to see that my local council, only two weeks ago, supplied me with several containers. One for glass, one for bottles, uh, plastic bottles, one for newspapers, and the other one for tins. They didn't actually supply me one for recycling my kitchen waste, which is disappointing. And typically that's what's been happening in the UK. All the food has been mixed with glass and bottles and cans and cartons that we don't want in an AD plant. Yes, you can take this co-mingled material and you can separate it at the AD plant, but it's not the most cost-effective way of doing so, in my opinion. If we can encourage the councils, the local authorities, the waste distribu uh, distribu uh, distribu collection authorities, I beg your pardon, to actually invest in the infrastructure and the systems to collect the food waste separately in a vehicle like this, we will save disposal costs and divert from landfill or in vessel composting, we will have the makings of an AD biomethane project. Food waste then into the AD plant. How much? Well, to achieve critical mass, around about 20 to 25,000 tons per annum or 2,000 households. There are, in Leeds, three quarters of a million households. There's potential if just those households went on to source segregated food into AD to achieve and exceed that number, probably in the region of 35,000 tonnes per annum going into AD. And then, of course, let's not forget that there's not only the household food waste, but all the waste from the restaurants, the kitchens, the hospitals, the schools could go into AD and suddenly critical, critical mass becomes very, very easily achievable. In the water industry, a very, very similar picture. And, clearly, the water industry opportunities, I believe, are going to revolve around co-digesting of the existing waste that is traditionally taken into the water treatment plants and food. So there's an opportunity there for water industry, the waste recycling sectors, local authorities, waste collection authorities, to consider working together to embrace AD, enhance the existing asset in the water industry, and process the food resource in there. Again, saving disposal costs, diverting from landfill, and making everything work. 30 to 35,000 tonnes per annum gets you to our suggested 300 cubic metres of biomethane critical mass, and that is around about 300,000, 350,000 households. Is there a potential for cross-sector collaboration? Well, here we have the sectors that are represented, the household, commercial, industrial food, waste disposal authorities, recycling, water industry and agriculture, and this is the typical way that the feedstock is distributed. I won't go into the details there. I do realize that there are challenges, that existing contracts are in, the pla in place, long-term contracts, particularly with the council household food arisings, and those contracts are very difficult to change. But for any council or local authority or waste distribution authority who is thinking in two, three years' time, contracts are up for renewal, maybe AD biomethane would be an option to consider. And, of course, not forgetting the digestate that is produced at the end of the process from the recycling industry and the water industry, agriculture is the most viable option 
for distribution of the digestate. But treatment can also be um, provided. So, getting on to business case development. And I'm doing my best not to touch on technical, Dan. What do we need to make a business case work? We obviously need a gas grid connection. And this is where Dan and his team come in. If you think you've got the makings of a project, talk to Nat Northern Gas Networks about a gas grid connection, the proximity and the flow profiles. See if it can work. If it can't work, what about a virtual network? Maybe put the biogas plant or the AD plant in a slightly different location to the gas main and either pipe the gas to it or compress it, bottle it and ship it in a vehicle that's running on biomethane. You need an electric grid connection because these things do need electricity to run them. You will of course need a suitable site. All things have to be considered about the site. Logistics, community engagement, the nimbyism, all those things. But we understand those challenges and we can overcome them and recommend the best place to put a plant. You need to add feedstock value, whether it be by lowering the cost of agricultural feedstocks that are going into the plant or increasing the opportunities for attracting gate fee um, driven feedstocks. You need to find an outlet for the digestate, again typically agriculture. You need to find partners. Those partners may be partners in a JV, an official formalized partnership. They may also just be partners who you have in an external contract to provide feedstock, third-party partners, or digestate outlets. You need, of course, to sell the energy. And Peter Williams from E.ON is going to be speaking later this morning about opportunities there. You need to secure the RHI, so you need to apply to Ofgem for accreditation to inject biomethane, not to inject biomethane, but to secure the tariff for injecting of biomethane. You may wish to look at enhancing the project with CO2 sales. And of course, there will be quite a number of legal and contractual aspects to look at as well. And of course, we have people here in the event outside in the trade stands who can advise you on that. And then when all those things are in place, and those are only a few of the major building blocks to get a plant into a position to get funding, then you're pretty ready to go and realize and put the first spade in the ground and build a plant. There's something missing off here. What is it? Probably more fundamental. I'm surprised. So many technology people in the audience and you haven't mentioned technology. Well, I was asked not to mention it, but we have to mention it because you don't get that without technology. So think very carefully about all these things, but also carefully about technology. You need to find a technology that suits your application you need to find a technology that enhances the business case. And very importantly, you need to find a technology and a provider who are going to be bankable and can actually pass due diligence that the funders will require. So finally, I've said enough this morning. Realize your goal. Make cash from gas. Talk to the people who are here today supporting your ideas and efforts and hopefully after today has concluded you will have some better understanding of what's required and you will take forward your ideas and develop AD projects. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for that, Rob. So hopefully you can see the piece of the jigsaw starting to slot into, into place. So Rob's give you a good background about what you need in a digester and the type of volumes we're talking about. Um, now I think it's uh, over to John, and then you'll get the opportunity for questions after that. It's about 15 minutes from John, um, and he's going to talk you through some credible commercial examples. So I'll pass you over to John.
Right, thanks. Is that? Yes, I can hear some echoes, so it must be working. Thank you. Now we're on. Right. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm John Murphy. I'm the business development manager for Future Biogas. And just a couple of words as to who Future Biogas is, or are, whatever the correct English is. Um, we're a joint venture between Future Energy Group, which is locally based here in Yorkshire, who have got nearly 50 years experience in the design and installation of gas infrastructures and networks. And Biogas Sustainable Energy, who are a Dutch-based renewable energy company, who, as confirmed this morning, have built and operate 15 um, biomethane to grid plants in Holland and they're just beginning to develop now plants in Denmark in Northern Europe so the business is growing. I've got the task of trying not to repeat a lot of what the other two speakers have said but giving you a commercial example to demonstrate what's already been said. Now there's only one working biomethane to grid plant in the country so I don't want to try to get the details and the, the, the figures from there so I've had to put together an example a theoretical example based on 15,000 tons per annum it's an agricultural example 15,000 tons of what Rob would call critical mass and that's made up of 30% manure and slurry and 70% grass silage and grain. Now that is just above Rob's, if you remember Rob's figure of 150 cubic metres per hour, that will give you just above uh, 150 cubic metres per hour. 275 cubic metres per hour of biogas, which when cleaned up and converted back will give you 160 cubic metres of biomethane to inject into the grid. What I'm going to do is look at the options for the same plant providing electricity and biomethane. Look at the differences, compare the two. I'm going to take a few minutes out to talk about useful energy, which Rob alluded to, but I'm going to talk about it in this particular instance. Uh, we'll look at the income, the surplus, the costs, capital costs, and the potential payback, which all forms part of the business plan to secure funding and to determine whether the scheme goes ahead or not. And as I say there at the bottom, it's just reiterating that this is a theoretical scheme because there's only one live project in the country and I didn't feel it was right to go badger them. So, you've produced your 275 cubic metres of biogas and what can you do with it? I mean, you've heard already this morning, so forgive, forgive me for repeating. You can simply put the biogas pipe it into a combined heat and power unit or a gas engine as I like to call it, an old fashioned gas engine. That will generate electricity. You can connect it to the grid, sell it to the grid and you get some money for it. Or, as we're trying to do, demonstrate a better option, you can clean up the biogas, you can add value to the biogas. The top picture there on the left is a piece of clean up equipment and as I think we keep saying, you'll hear it several times, there's a lot of different technologies to suit the type of biogas that's being produced, whether it's agricultural waste, food waste, works on volumes, it works on components of the biogas. There's a lot of technology to, make, to, to be able to make your mind up. And the guys that with that knowledge are out there in the hall. So please, either after the event, whatever, please talk to them. But in this particular instance, it lends itself to a membrane plant, no technicals, just a membrane plant, which we've included in our worked example. The bit in the middle is the, another critical piece, which is called many different things. You see at the top there, bio to grid, biomethane to grid injection unit, gas entry unit, gas injection unit, whatever. It's the piece of kit that the networks require us to install that analyzes the gas. If you remember Rob's uh, few words, the, the, bio, the methane is nearly the same constituency, constituency as the natural gas that's in the network. It's got to be treated and that piece of kit analyzes the gas to ensure compliance with what the grid will require. It also meters the gas, monitors it, that's how you get paid, 
and it also regulates the pressure for the network into which you're going to put the gas. At the bottom there, that's just a, an example. It's the only picture I can get, so don't worry. All your network connections don't look like that. They're not all as big as that. And um, that's just the depiction. But then you feed it in, and you get paid. And I think the next few slides are going to tell you why you get paid more for that than you do for this. I said we'll take a little bit of time to talk about useful energy. Now, whether you get this or you don't, it's mathematics. Whether you get it or you don't, I think it'll become evident when you see the, the final slide. In our example, that there represents the, com the components in the biogas that's produced from the digester. Roughly 58% will be methane. This varies, again, depending on your mix, as Rob alluded to. There's various recipes, but based on our mix, this is 58% is methane. About 40% will be carbon dioxide, and the rest, a small percent, probably nitrogen, a bit of water, whatever. There might be other bits and pieces in there. Um, the only energy value in that is the methane. The rest of it carries no energy value. So 58% of the biogas has got that energy value. If you decide to put that into a gas engine to generate electricity, yes, you can do that, but Rod was talking about a maximum efficiency of 43% on the engine. I've worked on an old-fashioned small engine which suits the size of production that you're getting in this example. It's less than 500 kilowatts and I've worked on 35% efficiency. So for the 58, so I say you might not get it, for the 58% of methane that's going into the engine, you're only getting 35%. So 35% of your 58% is converted into electricity. 5% or thereabouts is lost in combustion. The rest of it is heat and hot water that you can harness to use on your site to help the process, to, fight, uh, to keep the process warm. You need to maintain 40 degrees in your digester and you can use that. Or if you've got local usage for it, if you've got houses, an energy, an energy system, you have a hotel, you have anywhere that can use heat and hot water, you can harness 60% from the engine cooling system, the exhaust system, and the engine jacket. Now, if you can do that, stop, do it. Don't bother with anything else. That's the best option, just do that. But as I'm given to understand, in the industry, the main priority is to generate electricity to, to gain the revenue, and none of them use the waste heat. Now, if you look at the biogas, the biomethane example, when the gas is cleaned up, when the biogas is turned into biomethane, 100% of the cleaned up methane goes into the grid. And again, as I keep saying, if you don't get it, talk to us afterwards. But look at the green sections. That's what you get paid for. So I hope you can see what we're trying to say. So based on that, this is the income from our 15,000 tonnes per annum example. Electric, remembering what you've just seen, you will receive a feeding tariff, which R R Rob alluded to, but in this instance, because of the size of the plant, we've gone for an engine that's smaller than 500 kilowatts, and in fairness to the, to the example, that attracts um, a value of 14.02 pence per kilowatt hour, so it's greater than Rob's example for a larger unit. So we've tried to be fair on that. You need to sell the green electricity to an energy broker or to one of the energy suppliers. And again, Peter will cover all that later. And there's various prices banded about for that. I've, we've checked the market. But the average seems to be, as Rob said, 5.5 pence per kilowatt hour. So you 14.02 for the electricity feeding tariff and 5.5 pence per kilowatt hour for the electricity sale to the energy supplier. And that, based on our example, I'm not going to go into all the figures, I'd just blind you with figures if I did that, but £813,000 per annum would be the income, the gross income, from that scheme delivering electricity. If you convert the biogas into biomethane and feed it into the grid, it attracts the renewable heat incentive of 7.3 pence per kilowatt hour. And again, you sell the green gas to an energy supplier 
in order for it to get into the marketplace and to be sold on. Again, I know of various different prices, but we're taking an average today, as a fair example, at 2.5 pence per kilowatt hour. So you have 7.3, 2.5, and that will generate you an income of just less than 1.4 million pounds. So the picture's getting better. Um, the tariffs, the feeding tariffs, as again, confirming what Rob said, they are government incentives and they're administered by Ofgem. But an important part is that once you sign up, that is a 20-year contract. It's index linked to the retail prices index, so it will move with inflation if, if, if necessary. And I also believe, as Peter will tell you, that the energy companies will also support a long-term contract in line with that. Now, that's, that's good news for the finance industry when you're looking to seek finance. Again, as with anything, you've got expenses. Uh, Rob alluded to expenses, but in this particular instance, if you're providing electricity into the network, well, for both at this moment in time, feedstock is your biggest expense. I'm not going to go into all, all the figures there. I can do. If you want to ask me, I'll, I'll tell you. But all those figures there, feedstock is your biggest expense. You're provi producing the biogas, so the feedstock's the same, whichever way you're going to do it. Maintenance is greater on a biomethane plant because you've more equipment. Normally the maintenance is taken care of by a maintenance agreement with the equipment suppliers, the engine supplier or whatever. Um, you've got the clean-up plant and it needs to be kept up to shape. Regular maintenance, it's difficult parts because this thing needs to work to clean up the gas as many hours a year as you can. And By the way, our example is based on 8,300 8, hours per year which is 95% of the, the full year. That allows downtime for maintenance and such like. Management of the plant is also greater on a biomethane plant because you have more information that's required, more professional management of the plant, if I dare say that. Um, there's more technical information, there's more um, interpretation of that information, there's more tweaking to do, and that ne needs more resources. So that's the difference in the, the management of the two plants. The energy, now this is something just worth a, a minute to explain, that is bought in energy to run either a, an electricity plant or a biomethane plant. You can take your electric power from the gas engine that's generating the electricity for you. On the, pl the gas plant you can put in a small parasitic engine to generate your power which alleviates the need for you to buy in the power now if you do that I could have done that I've not done that I've assumed that the engine on the gap on the electric plant is all the electric generated is going into the network and there's no engine involved in the biomethane plant you buy it all in I've done the sums and it works out more or less the same so there's no, in the figures there's there's no discrepancy or no great discrepancy in it the problem that I would have had trying to explain it to you is the incentives that you get for this, what you have to knock off for that, what you have to add on for that, and what you get for the RHI. I would have confused myself as well as yourselves, but I've done that off the record, and it doesn't make a right lot of difference to those figures. The big difference on the biomethane plant is cost for propane, because the methane that comes out of the digester, and out of the cleanup plant, should I say, prior to going into the network, will have a calorific value, an energy value, of about 36, 37 megajoules per cubic meter. I said I wouldn't talk technical, but it doesn't matter, it's just figures. It needs to be, I think in NGN's area, about 39 megajoules per cubic meter. And the only way to raise the calorific value is to add propane. So the propane injection unit required and the cost of the propane, that's about £80,000 on that, so it's not cheap, that's £80,000 on, on this example. Um, the reason for that is really the energy value is that you've got this, whoever buys the gas and uses the gas once it's gone into the grid has got the same energy value as everybody else. You, you're not changing the value by putting in substandard calorie value gas. That's just a summary of the position so far. So you can see there that 
income, expenditure, you have a surplus on an electricity scheme of £411,000 per year and £800,000 on biomethane. Now, if you assume as well that's a 20-year contract, over 20 years that's worth £16 million, index linked, which is why we've put a little pot of gold at the side. What's it all going to cost? We've had to make some assumptions in, on this because we've assumed the site has got planning permission, we've assumed there's no legal problems with easements or land ownership, there's enough land to build on and there's no hindrance, the feedstock is sorted, all the contracts are in place for the feedstock because trying to factor that in is very difficult to give you a, a right analysis because every site, every site is different, every site will be different. So assuming those Facts are in, those things are in place, I think it's fairly accurate figure to say that a, uh, a 270, well, a 15,000 ton per annum plant digester, 500 kilowatt engine, fully installed with all the storage, the clamps, the hoppers, all the connections, it costs you about 2.2 million pounds. Fairly happy with that price. To produce biomethane, we've knocked out the engine, which is about £400,000 of that first value. So you're at £1.8 million for a digester. So there you need the clean-up plant, you need the gas, in, uh, gas to grid injection unit, a little bit of propane injection equipment, and we reckon that's about £1.5 million fully installed, which is where the £3 million for the biomethane plant comes in. So it's more expensive, but you've seen what the revenue and the returns are. Now, what we haven't done as well on this is include the grid connection costs or any non-contestable charges that the networks, certainly in the electric, will possibly impose. Now, they are totally unknown and totally different for every, 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 every job, every plant will be different. You could be sat on top of a network or you could be 10 kilometres from the network. So it's a bit unfair to give an example that may not be relevant to yourself. So we've gone on known facts and figures. So that's the costs for the comparative plants and the payback which is again something that the financial people and yourselves will be very interested in and again I'll talk you through it but it's there for you all to see you've got 5.4 years payback on an electric AD plant and 3.8 years payback on a biomethane plant one thing I would say that I've just been working out while I've been sat here <coughs> The electric figures were based on 35% efficiency of the engine. If it was around 40%, because that's a nice round figure, it makes about £40,000 difference to the income, which would probably make that electric payback about 5.3 years instead of 5.4. So that's how little influence the choice of your engine has on it. And that really is all I would like to say, other than I hope that very brief example has given you a little bit of insight into what potential revenues there are, what the costs are, engendered some enthusiasm, and please talk to us afterwards or talk to the providers outside. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, John. Um, that, that's going to be at the end of the morning sessions before the coffee break, so we're just going to have 10 or 15 minutes of questions now. Um, hopefully that kind of pieces these bits of the jigsaw together with that practical example, but obviously there's lots of caveats around that, as the, uh, that's just an example. But certainly it, it makes a, a quite strong case for the biomethane option as opposed to just maybe the electrical option. So uh, I, what I'd probably like to do is invite the speakers, if you want to come back up, um, to our Jeremy Kyle set. And um, I think, uh, Linda, have you got the mics? So we'll just probably have 15 minutes of questions, and then we're going to have a 15-minute coffee break back in for half past 11, where Eon and the finance guys are going to talk you through the funding. Okay. Are we using, you use these? Yeah, a few. Okay, have we, got, have we got any questions to start off with? Linda, do you want, if you could just wait for the mic, because the camera needs to pick you up. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Is it switched on? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, 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 good presentations. Never quite been um, experienced uh, in this industry. Such good presentations. Um, two questions, really. You mentioned that um, on the gas network uh, pipe system that it may be full when you want to put your gas in. It could be overloaded. There, there isn't space. Well, that's not the case on the national grid, is it? You know, we, I, I don't know that you can't get your electricity onto the grid. There's usually room for it. And the second one was the last gentleman said that if you could use the heat, then, you, you, you know, that's a, but you didn't put a figure on that. If we're producing, um, and then we could use the heat for glass houses or something, then it would equate much better, wouldn't it, for profit. The well, profit margin with, with, that, with, Without studying the actual specific example, I'm going to say yes immediately because your biogas, if you just go back to that little picture, the depiction, the biogas is feeding into an engine which is yeah. going to give you 35% yeah. if you like. Well, if it's a 1,000 kilowatts of biogas going into the engine, you're probably going to get something like two or 300 kilowatts of electric coming out of it. The other 700 kilowatts is, the, is recoverable waste heat, yeah. basically. And, if you can, and that's for free because you're paying the money to get the electricity. Yeah. And, and the waste heat is for free. Now, if you can utilize all that, then it makes the case better. I'm not going to say it's the way to go. I did say it's the way to go there because on our example, it's the way to go. But on a bigger scheme, it may be part of a remit of options that you take. So it would need to be, if you like, evaluated in its own right. Your particular scheme evaluated in its own right, looking at the various options. I don't know, does that, is that well, a fair you answer? Didn't a, you didn't put a value on it. That was oh, sorry. Well, you, 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 yes, well, at the moment, you would derive renewable heat incentive for the heat that you, for the heat oh. you're generating, but that's up to a maximum at the moment of 200 kilowatts. 200 kilowatts per hour. Yeah. So you wouldn't, again, if you got 700 kilowatts, you'd only be paid for 200, which I apologise, I didn't put the value on that. But yeah. well, that's something that needs to be put into the figures and the calculations for you. Thank you very much. Just on the first part of your question um, about the injection rates, um, yeah, you do need a main, a main that you can continuously inject into. But there's lots of innovation pieces going on at the moment. So in Northern Gas Networks last year, we actually trialled a compressor to artificially compress um, out of a lower pressure back into a higher pressure to create a kind of artificial demand mm. in the main. So there's things that we're doing. I, I can't comment on the electricity industry. I'm not an expert in that field. I don't know if you can constantly feed in, but um, certainly in the gas industry, we're trying to do things to try and facilitate um, that injection to be easier. But um, the other alternative is you'd have to go further away to an appropriate main, which again, when you start looking at your business plan with the project managers and the networks, that obviously factors in because that's a cost. Thank you. Can I just mention the electric example that you gave us, that the electric network don't normally refuse. Now, they possibly don't. They've got the capacity. They need the capacity, if you listen to the news and whatever. But it's not normally the main that's outside your door that's adequate to take the, the, the connection. It may be two or three kilometres away, and it needs to go to a primary substation or whatever. They will, just, just as Northern Gas Networks will do, they'll do a study and advise you where the appropriate point of connection is. And that's what the electric companies do. Now, yes, if you sat on the grid, as I said up there, then no problem. Again, it's, it's a no-brainer, decision's made. But if, you've got, if they've got the capacity, but you've got to run it five, six, seven kilometres, then you've got to think twice. Thank you. Any more questions? I've got a question for Rob. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about virtual networks. Can you just expand a little bit on that? I uh, don't think you really expanded fully on what that is. Yeah, good question. I was conscious of time, so I didn't dwell on that because it, it is going to take a little bit of explaining. But essentially, what I was alluding to there was the ability to introduce a virtual network which is not actually the network that you're connecting to uh, at Northern uh, Gas or any other of the gas district network operators pipes it's actually the networks before that so it's between the anaerobic digestion plant and the actual grid and this enables a number of smaller AD plants 
to be built in a cluster and then a private pipeline to feed the biogas, not the biomethane, but the biogas from each of those small AD plants to a centralized biogas upgrading system which upgrades the biogas to biomethane and at that point then injects it into the national grids, uh, northern gas networks and national grid and all the other networks systems. So that means that potentially what I was talking about in terms of critical mass AD plant size that could be contracted, it could come down because you have a number of smaller AD plants that are feeding in a large amount in aggregate total of biogas to be upgraded and injected into the network. The second way of doing that is something that is currently I believe been done in Scotia gas networks area and that is actually taking the biomethane, upgrading it and if you don't have a gas grid connection opportunity within feasible distance or that has the right profile to allow the network entry agreement to enable you to inject 24 hours a day or almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, you can actually take that biomethane and you can compress it into cylinders and you can ship it to another part of the network where you can actually secure a flat profile, as we call it, network injection opportunity. Does that explain? The Thank you for the opportunity to do that. Thanks. Well, good answer, Rob. Uh, Primo? Uh, could I ask about digestate? And the thing that worries me a little bit about this, that on your list of people here today, there's nobody from the EA. And uh, I find it a bit strange when one of your biggest problems with all this is getting rid of the digestate, that we're not having a little bit of input from the Environment Agency about what we can and can't do. And as you say, your council, big digesters, one of the big issues for them will actually be getting rid of the digested. So Can very, you clarify good, this a bit, please? It's a very, very good question. And of course, um, quite often when developing projects, it's quite advantageous to actually look at the end of the process as opposed to the beginning and make sure that what you actually do at the front of the design and the process, you can actually achieve at the back end as well. So you for sure do need a lot of land for spreading digestate on. This is going to be influenced by, of course, the environmental pollution control regulations. It's going to be influenced by NVZ, nitrogen vulnerable zone regulations. And all of those things are known and quantifiable. Rather than going into a lot of detail now, I will say and admit that you need a lot of land. You need to make sure that you are compliant with your spreading of digestate in terms of nutrient to land and to have a management plan to enable you to do that. And typically you're going to need hundreds of acres in old money, possibly hundreds of hectares of land on which to spread digestate depending on the size of your plant. As I mentioned in my uh, presentation, 100% volume in equals 85% digestate volume out. So, <coughs> thinking about the number of tons of feedstock that we're going to be putting in a plant, there's going to be 85% of that coming out as a nutrient-rich digestate, which we need to find a home for. And typically, the most cost-effective way is agricultural land. But I can't actually give you a quantified answer on that without further discussion. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Max Ford uh, from a company called Greener for Life. Uh, my first question to you, John, on the uh, maths you put up on the board, uh, what account have you taken for rent uh, on agricultural land and the... Uh, ever increasing price of land when I first got into agriculture maybe what 350 pound an acre we're now talking at 7,000 pounds an acre have you taken that into your cost analysis and to you Michael uh, on 
Put your hand up, I can't see. Sorry, you. I'm here. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to you, Michael, on, on the spent digestate, um, many farmers obviously have slurry lagoons which they handle their, 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 their cow manure. Now you are suggesting that this cow manure obviously goes into the uh, digester. Uh, these farmers have sort of bespoke plans for actually dribbling or injecting the waste uh, on, onto the ground. Can that sort of be a, 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 um, a solution to the gentleman's problem behind me? You go first. I'll just answer the little bit first. And as I thought, I hoped I'd said, didn't allow anything for that. Certainly aware of those costs, planning costs, uh, rental. I think was 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 the 2.2 million. Did that include the any land rental? Because we took it for granted that you owned the land. There was no legal problems, no sort of land ownership problems, no easement problems. We had to take we had to take an assumption. No, I know you can't, but we had to take an assumption to put the figures up there. When you do an, an individual analysis for every scheme is different, everybody will have different sites, different locations, different proximities to whatever, different feedstock sources and so on. So that was just a flavour of the difference between a, 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 an electrical plant and a, a biomethane plant. And I said we'd made some assumptions that certain things like the, 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 the site side of it, was assumed to be okay and not allowed for. The grid connections, the non-contestable charges as I call them, are going to be different for every scheme so we couldn't allow them either because to work out an example there would have been so many caveats and guesswork and such like we worked on known figures to show you the relationship between the two subject to each individual scheme being analysed afterwards separately for yourselves. <coughs> We also haven't included, if you, if you notice on there, which I didn't mention, any interest payments or payments back to the, the funders. Because, again, that's not known at this moment in time. Every scheme is different. It depends what they want. So we couldn't put figures in there that may sway the case one way or the other. We were trying to show a, a comparison based on equal, sort of, equal factors. If, Well, that just happened to be the one I picked. I actually suggested at the end, no, I suggested at the end, if it was 40%, it would make £40,000 extra revenue, if you like, on the income for the electrical scheme. Well, that's my, I've got all manned up to that. That's my figure. I picked that from an, an engine, some engine information that I had to hand. I think just on that, what, what we're trying to do, and we're not, we're not saying here that every scheme is exactly the same as this, what, what John's tried to do is produce an example. Uh, he did mention that if you went for 40%, it made, I think, was it £40,000 a 40, year difference? Pounds difference. So uh, it, it's important, it's just, yeah, it, it's, just, it's just worth probably pointing out that the example is there purely as an example. And all we're trying to say is, or trying to d demonstrate that there's only one viable biomethane project in the UK at the moment. There's actually injection. Two. Yeah. No, but the, the, yeah, there's no, no. Yeah. No, we're, we're, yeah. we're aware of all those, but there's, not, there's, 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 there's none that have been running long enough to take the figures. So by the end of the year, there'll be more, and then there'll be more comparable data and things like that. But we're, we're just trying to really show, and it's always a dodgy thing to put figures around stuff, but to just show the quantity of energy that you, you transfer in the RHI and things like that. It, it's, it's an example, but like John and Rob stressed on numerous occasions, you need to take everyone's own individual circumstances. Do you own the land? Are you near a connection? Uh, do you have an outlet for the digest date? Could you possibly sell on the CO2? If you do own CHP, can you recapture the heat? There's lots of different um, things you could do in there, but in, in 15 minutes, you're not going to cover all of them. So what I'd suggest is all them type of questions, you maybe have a chat to John about later, just please, to, please to walk do, around yes. them issues a little bit more, because it's, it's always difficult to put that example up there but it's it's there to try and stimulate the conversation at, at the back so sorry Dan I think the other sorry. part of the gentleman's question hasn't been answered so if I may um, you're quite right if we're putting animal slurries and manures into an AD plant it is likely that that farmer already has equipment for storing and managing that product 
and by managing I mean apply, applying to land. And the same equipment can be used for applying digestate to land with probably a small adaptation. So in other words, a tractor and a tanker would typically apply slurry to land. These days, it's not allowed to be thrown up in the air in the old traditional way. You have to apply it close to, if not on the ground, or in some cases, in the ground. The same would apply to digestate, exactly. So that equipment could be utilised. And just to actually extend that question, um, if a farmer is putting his slurry and manure into an AD plant, the actual NPK levels don't change that significantly, but the nitrogen will be enhanced. In other words, it will be turned into more available nitrogen through a digester. Very good questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, Saeed Ahmed from the Green Gas Certification Scheme. A quick question for Dan. Uh, can you um, provide a little bit of detail on this Rio formula that you mentioned that's running for the next eight years or so? What incentives or requirements or anything else that might be in place for you as a business to uh, enter into the biomethane market in terms of connections and any other business you might be doing? Yeah, Thanks. I mean, it, uh, the Rio thing isn't a formula. It's, it's, it's a term. It's, it's an acronym, basically. Uh, for the revenue plus innovation plus incentives equals output. So it's, it's off GEM's um, term for purely for the price control period that we're in. Now, them outputs, there's lots and lots of outputs for every network. Um, you can have outputs around asset health, so the number of assets we're going to upgrade with our allowance in a year. We have outputs around um, standards for gas escapes. We have, we have lots and lots of outputs that are measurable by our regulator. So the funding that we've requested in this price control period, which is 2013 to 2021, is to deliver a suite of outputs. And the outputs that are relevant to this biomethane agenda are the two that I put up, which are the measurable ones, which are the total, num the total amount of biomethane connected, which isn't actually quantified, but at the moment in our network, it's none. Um, and the total amount of active inquiries. And again, they're not specified, but they're more as an incentive measure to try and help um, and support the networks and actively encourage the networks to try and raise the profile. Um, now, NGM, we're, we're kind of on this journey anyway, like a lot of the networks are, and this is how we're trying to raise the prof profile of it and see if we can just ignite some um, enthusiasm around the, around the area for not just those who already maybe are informed, but those who maybe are, are kind of hearing a lot of this for the first time to at least start asking the questions. And a lot of these plants might not be viable, but some of them will be, as, as we've demonstrated there. There might be five by the end of this year. Well, that's not in our patch. So uh, it, it, in terms of that, it, it's not an equation. It's, it's an acronym for the price control, and it's all about innovation. Yeah. Probably time for one more, maybe. One more. Uh, Sean Edwards, Curran Brown, Project Managers. Uh, John, you mentioned there's actually only one live project in the UK. Uh, if that's the case, uh, where is all the, the expertise, the experience in running these types of projects to ensure they're actually on budget to schedule and meet the business case? Well, as you heard from the other remarks, there are more than one being built as we speak, because we're involved in them as well. But there's only one that's been running since last October at Poundbury and that's the one that would produce any figures that we could have used on there. So that's why that was theoretical, because none of them have been in operation long enough. We, could, we, could get the capital, we can get the capital costs from that and other costs from that, but the revenues, uh, the annual operational costs and such like, would not be available. It would be just like mine. It would be theoretical at this stage. There's only Poundbury, and I didn't think it was right to go down badgering Poundbury for a theoretical example that we could use in the past. And the, I think um, Dan alluded to the other remark about where's all the technology and such like that, uh, to build this. I think the, the, the technology providers have been there for a long time, but the regulation and the requirements, the technical requirements of it, have been resolved by um, various committees over the last two or three years when we got into this. The job was going to be done a certain way. Now it's totally turned on its head without going into a lot of um, explanations. So I think the availability of funding has always been a problem to the jobs kicking off, as well as the regulation surrounding it. The regulation and the barriers to entry on the choice of equipment has now gone. 
and the funding appears to be in place because jobs are now progressing quite swiftly. Uh, there's, a, there's also potential reviews to the um, investments, uh, the incentives, should I say, and people are trying to take advantage of um, securing those incentives while they are still available. And that's why I think there's going to be a glut of acceptances for construction next year. The, 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 the one in NGN's patch um, at um, Howden, that will be going ahead. I think orders are going to be placed imminently and it will be a 12-month build period. So, yeah, the technology's been there and we've all been bang banging out the, uh, the message, but certain, if you like, regulator regulatory barriers and financial barriers have uh, slowed up the process, if you like. I don't know whether that answers your question, but that's, that's, that's my response. I think it's a, it's a very good question, um, and I think it's a very pertinent question for a lot of people who maybe aren't experienced in this, which is most people, because there's not that many things about... Um, but I, I would also refer to the fact that in, in Holland, and certainly Biogas, they've got 16 plants up and running, which John alluded to. So there's the expertise to do this, and certainly in the UK, and, and the companies are out here in the exhibition, so please go and talk to them. There, are, there is the expertise there to build these plants. And they're not rocket science uh, at the end of the day, but you do need expertise. And what I would say to anybody who's looking at it, um, and there's different challenges from different sectors, so obviously we've heard some challenges there from the, the um, farming sector, but obviously we've talked to lots of different sectors who could take the opportunity, but what I would say to everybody is if they, they want to talk about it seriously, that they need to talk to the experts to really understand it better and to make sure that they're supported through the entire process end-to-end, -end, right through to obtaining funding and then actually into the build if they don't have that in-house expertise, which is unlikely. And can I just add one thing? Yeah. And I don't think this was, um, certainly I didn't present it, and I maybe should have done in hindsight. Um, I don't think this was, was mentioned. What we're looking at here is the, the, the biomethane to grid injection system, cleanup system, is the element of the AD facility that currently is not out there in great numbers in the UK. The core AD plant, the feeding system, the feedstocks even, the tank, and everything that surrounds the core AD plant doesn't change significantly from an AD, that's do, AD plant that's supplying biomethane to a CHP for electricity generation or an AD plant that's supplying a biomethane upgrading system for biomethane to grid. So, the core technology remains the same. We've had a lot of those built in the UK, 110, 120, and climbing. The expertise is there for that. The expertise is overseas and now starting to come into the UK for the biomethane upgrading and the gas to grid system. Good comments, Rob. So, so right, well, well, thanks for your contributions, everybody, and hopefully you found that first session useful and informative. Um, we're going to have a, a coffee break now and a, and a comfort break, so we're aiming for about 15 minutes, so if you could try and get back in for about half, half an hour. Ten. Half an hour. It's Dan. half an hour. Dan. And could I just tell everyone that there are refreshments on the mezzanine floor and also in the Claxton room, which is adjacent, and there are a number of exhibition stands in there as well, so you don't have to queue right outside. So, quarter to 12.